Thank you very much. Hello everybody and good morning. Um, my name is Bath Moffitt, I'm co-founder um, and CEO of the Well HQ and we are here to talk about whether women belong in sport. And it's quite a controversial topic and I know some of you are like, why on earth have you entitled a whole talk, the first talk of this event with this title? Um, and we're going to be here today to explain like, what we mean by this question. Um, and kind of like really kind of hopefully get you to think. And when, when I've been talking with Richard about what we were going to cover in this talk today, um, we were talking about it a good few months ago now. Um, I'll give Richard the credit, I'll give him some credit for kind of like what we're going to really hone in on. We're going to hone in on injury and concussion in girls and women, and it couldn't be more relevant with everything that's been happening over the last few weeks in the world of football and the DCMS guidance that's come out on concussion at grassroots. But before we do that, we're going to address this first question around do girls and women belong in sport? Those of you um, that are big fans of Brené Brown, of which we are a huge fan, uh, will have no doubt seen this quote a number of times. And if you've heard any of us talk at the Well HQ, we always start lots of, most of our talks with this quote. There is a huge and significant difference between belonging and fitting in. And that's where this question came from for this talk today. To truly belong, we shouldn't have to change who we are, but we need to be who we are. And at the moment, the girls and women are fitting into a system that has not been designed for them. And there are, there are many things that we need to address, but until we change the system, until we acknowledge that girls and women are totally different uh, to men and boys, then they're just going to carry on fitting into the system of sport, exercise and fitness, and they won't be truly belonging. So on this slide here, you will see 12 tiles. If we focus on the 12 tiles on the bottom, and these are all the things that happen differently and exclusively inside of a woman's body. And they're really important parts of a woman's physiology and anatomy. We're not considering any of these parts of a woman's body, broadly speaking, when we are creating our sport, fitness and exercise spaces. And so, if we're not considering these things, then girls and women can't, can't belong. So the things that happen exclusively, like her menstrual cycle, her periods, the fact that she has breasts that need to be contained when she's doing physical activity, um, the fact that her, um, you know, she has a pelvic floor. Everyone has a pelvic floor, but women have much higher rates of dysfunction than men. We need to be taking all of these things into account because then that creates the, the environment where girls will feel they truly belong. But not only that, it means that we are creating, it makes them healthy. So if we go along that top line now, unless a girl knows how to manage her menstrual cycle symptoms, unless a woman knows how long should it really take for her to return to the field of play after having a baby, unless a woman knows that um, she should really be starting her menstrual cycle by the age of 16 and that's a vital sign of health, Unless, unless women know all of those things, then they can't be healthy. And within the world and context of high performance sport, which I know many of you have come from today, um, health is not something that we necessarily talk about. We always like to you know, talk about performance. We genuinely feel that performance and health can sit alongside each other and exist in the same space. But for too long, all, all the balls, if you like, all the been put into the world of performance, and actually we have very, very unhealthy athletes. But in terms of females, we have to be considering all of these things on this slide. But it also um, really affects their performance. Um, Emma Ross is going to be coming on in a, in a few moments to be talking about the injury and concussion side of things. But if we just think about bras, it might surprise you to know that if I, I, I didn't run the London Marathon, but if I did run the London Marathon a week ago and I lined up on the start line and I was wearing a bra that didn't really fit me very well and then next to me was the exact, there was an avatar of myself stood next to me and she was wearing a bra that fitted her brilliantly, the per, the, my avatar would finish a mile faster than I would. And that is regardless of how fast I am, whether I It has that level of impact. Now, Emma Ross 
I'm giving her a lot of credit here because she really deserves it, but she did a big project with EIS when she was there, and she, Tokyo was the first Olympic Games where all the British athletes were fitted for a sports bra. Okay, Tokyo. So that was a couple of years ago. Up until that stage, you were offered small, medium and large from Adidas, which meant that, you know, if you were a gymnast, you were offered the same type and style of bra as the weightlifters were. Because, and, and those of you that are involved in grassroots sport, any kind of sponsorship deals, you will understand that often underwear, sports bras, are not seen as an essential performance enhancing piece of kit. So that's what I mean, that this really does affect our performance as well. And it's without a doubt a duty of care, and I think that hopefully you know, most of you in here will have huge interest in that, that side of things. If you think about what's happened with the world of concussion, it is the duty of those looking after the players to make sure they are, that, uh, that if someone is concussed, it is up to them to remove them from that field of play and return them in a, in a sequential way over time and they've got to hit certain um, things before they can kind of like progress back onto the field of play. If you ask that rugby player, as an example, once they've been concussed, do you want to go back on? They say yes, of course I want to go back on, but we've decided it's not their call. We now know that the menstrual cycle is an absolutely vital sign of health, and if a woman doesn't have a menstrual cycle, she's far more likely to have issues with her fertility, issues with her bone density, she may even be at risk of breaking bones and have stress fractures, and she might even be on hormone replacement therapy much, uh, and have osteoporosis at a much younger age. So this is a duty of care, considering all of this stuff. Because when I was on the, I was on the British Road Team for four years, when I was on the British Road Team, sort of a long time ago now, um, in that sort of 2004-2008 cycle, we kind of didn't know the, the, how important all of, these, uh, all of these key areas were. We know that now, so it's not good enough to be ignoring this within the, within the system of definitely in high performance sport, but throughout sport. The second quote, is uh, from James Clear, and that is that we do not rise to the level of our goals and we fall to the level of our symptoms. So it's okay to say that we want to be a game for life, or we want, you know, we want equality in terms of that gender representation. We want our men, our men and women, to, to win the same amount of medals at Olympic and World World Championship level. But unless we change the system, that's not going to happen. And I'm just going to leave you with a couple of examples here. And, you know, I can, I can rewrite this slide every week with examples of international athletes who have been let down by the system. But if, an example is Bobby Clay, who's um, on, the top, on the top there. She was an aspiring um, British athlete. She was kind of in the talent pathway. Um, she, she was a 1500 metre runner. She was definitely kind of like had her eyes on, on the Olympic Games, being, um, being, being really, really good at that international level. She got into it, she was talent spotted, she got into the performance programme that believed that lighter was better. She trained harder and harder and harder, restricted more and more of her calorific intake. She uh, was doing a recovery swim one day. She pushed off the wall in the swimming pool and she broke her leg. Right? So anyone that knows anything about swimming, you, it's, you shouldn't be able to break a leg in a swimming pool. She broke her leg because her bones were so thin, she'd never started her menstrual cycle. She hadn't started her menstrual cycle at 40, at 50, at 60. She went to the doctors every year and she said, I haven't started my period yet. Like, is this okay? And they're like, oh no, you're okay because you're an international athlete and don't worry about it. As soon as you stop running, you'll be fine. Um, she, she's now on the HRT, hormone replacement therapy, stronger than her mum, who is post, who's postmenopausal. Now that's an extreme, extreme example, but we hear it happening all the time. We look at Jasmine Sawyer. Now, thankfully, yeah, Jasmine's like really done a, a brilliant job, very you know, recently at the European indoors. But at the Rio Olympics, before she was about to step out onto the um, uh, onto the qualifying round to get into the final of the long jump, she was doubled over in pain in the doctor's room because of her period. Now. We can't cross our fingers and hope that our international athletes don't have their period on the day of, on the day of their Olympic qualifying round. There's, there's lots of chat around, you know, managing menstrual cycles and training around your menstrual cycle and how that's a great thing. But what we have to believe, know and believe is that actually a woman can perform at whatever level she wishes to perform at any given day of her cycle. But we are not diligently exploring the options and how can we support Jasmine if we knew that her knee flared up for a couple of days a month, regardless of what the issue was, everyone would be all over that. Everyone would be all over that. And if she went to one doctor and they said, oh, 
that we can do about it. You'd go and find another doctor and you try physios, you try strapping techniques, you try lotions and potions and different warm ups and you'd kind of work out a way that Jasmine could compete at any given day of her cycle. When it came to her period, she went to the doctors, she got a, she got a hormone and contraceptive pill, it didn't work for her, so she just gave up. And that wasn't because she gave up, it's because the system gave up, because we don't, we don't keep going when it comes to women's health. So that system has let her down. And the last person is Lorraine Lambert that I want to talk about, who, and she doesn't mind talking about her in these terms, is a larger chested lady, and she's a rifle shooter, and I don't know much about the technology of shooting, so you, you must like, forgive me if I don't get the terminology correct, but she has to hold this, this gun to shoot this target and it can't touch her body. But because her breast tissue is, is big, like, it gets in the way. And so no one was able to fit her with the right sports bra, but as soon as she worked with the sports scientists at Portsmouth and with, um, and, and with Emma, um, she was able to get the sports bra that fitted her, it adapted to her shape and size as she went through her menstrual cycle, so now she could accurately shoot all the time. But that was, that's only happened very, very recently. So that's what we mean by the fact that we have, we can talk about how amazing women's sport is and like how, like how we're an absolute rising tide when it comes to the coverage we're getting and, and like the investment and everything that's coming through, but actually what we need to be doing is fundamentally changing the system because there are still huge issues and we believe that has to all come through education. But I'm going to now leave you for the next 15 minutes uh, with Dr. Emma Ross. Thank you, thank you, Baz. Uh, good morning, everybody. reach a slightly different audience and uh, I'm going to try and kind of carry on the message that uh, Baz was giving you uh, because it might seem a weird question do women belong in sport because you are all sitting here going well yeah because you know look at women's sport we love it we've embraced women's sport there was a study in 2022 done by Durham University of 2,000 male football fans and two thirds of them held misogynistic sexist and hostile views towards women playing football we have still got a long way to go for women to feel like everyone feels like they belong. But Baz has just described how it's not enough to only change people's perceptions. It's not enough to put the England team in blue shorts and go, isn't it amazing? We've, we've realised in 2023 that girls have periods and that it might be quite anxious for them to be on the pitch whilst they're having a period in white shorts. So we put them in blue shorts. Isn't this brilliant? We've just changed football. No. Football is still a system that was designed by men for men because that's who played there first. And that's okay, except when women have come along, we've slotted them into that man-shaped hole. And that's because all of the research, all of the way we train our coaches, all of the way we train our physiotherapists, all of the way we train our sports doctors, is based on evidence, research, experiments done, essentially on male bodies. So what we understand as best practice, what we understand as the best approach to nutrition, recovery, um, training preparation, is based on what is optimised for a male body. Uh, I published a paper a couple of years ago which looked at sport and exercise science research. And we found that only 6% of that research was done exclusively on groups of women. Now the tiles that you just saw, menstrual cycles, periods, bras, pelvic floor dysfunction, we need to study those in women who do sport. 6% of sport and exercise science medicine research is done on those groups of women. So we don't know enough yet to really optimise sport as a system for women, but we do know enough because we have lots of information about where we can do better. And one of those areas is injury. Um, when I was working at the English Institute of Sport, now the UK Institute of Sport, recently the name changed in the last week, um, we invested lots and lots of money in a whole team that was designed to reduce the number of days lost to injury and illness. Because we knew that as a determinant of success, if we could just get athletes to show up and do the training that they were meant to do on any given day, we could amplify their chances of achieving their goal. In fact, there was a paper that said the chances of achieving whatever you've set out as your goal is increased by seven times 
if you can do the training that is prescribed for you and not lose days to injury and illness. So we know this is a really important part, whether you're uh, supporting women who are exercising for participation in health or for performance, that keeping them active across the whole of their lives is really fundamental. Um, here we go. Um, so I'm going to kind of hone in on, it was it on the introductory video, some of these, you know, headlines around ACL injuries. Um, because being female is a risk factor for injury. Women are four and a half times more likely to suffer a non-contact ACL injury. Um, some of the research shows up to eight times more likely. We're seeing this in football a lot. I was uh, on a podcast yesterday with a Charlton player and had six ACLs this season. I believe that one of the other Premiership league, uh, teams is on their fifth ACL injury this season. Now, actually, when you look across football, the prevalence of injury is actually quite equal between the men and women's games. But where the difference lies is that the prevalence of severe injury is greater in a women's game. Women players spend 20% longer off the pitch because of injury. In particular, ACL is six times more prevalent in football than it is in female football than it is in male football. Um, that injury risk uh, extends across the body twice as likely to be injured in the shoulder and the ankle. Um, of all the back pain sufferers, 20% more are women. Interestingly, um, with back pain, the, the risk factors for back pain in men are things like being overweight, having a sedentary or unhealthy lifestyle. Uh, the risk factors in women are because we don't move very well. Uh, and I'm going to get into a bit about our anatomy and our biomechanics. But the reasons why we suffer are because of how our body is kind of set up for movement. And that's where sport can play a really important role. Because done well, sport can create resilient bodies that don't get injured. Done poorly, we just expose people to greater risk. So, um, I was sat with these, this panel on the podcast yesterday, players, pundits of women's football, and they were saying, what is it? Because, you know, we've got these six players down, they're all wearing the same boots. Could it be the boots? Could it be the playing surface? Could it be this? Could it be that? There is no one reason why these women are being injured. Injury is a complex storm of risk factors that kind of meet in this one moment, on a pitch, in a race, and ACLs tear, they rupture. Um, unfortunately, the risk factors list for women is much longer. And what we need to do in sport is shorten that list. So the exposure to risk is much less. So the things we can't change are the fact that as females, we have wider hips. Uh, we, our bodies are designed to be able to give birth to children, and therefore we have a wider pelvis to allow that to happen. That means the angle between our hips and our knees is greater than in a male body. Males are kind of straighter down. That puts more angular stress through a knee joint. It just puts the knee under greater stress just from having this skeleton. The other thing we can't change is the fact that we have hormones in our body as women that influence uh, things like our joint laxity, the looseness and stability of our joints. Now you heard there on the video, lots of people like to say, oh, you know, women have hormones that make them an increased risk of injury. We don't actually have robust evidence about the role these hormones play in injury. So every time you read a headline that says the menstrual cycle is responsible for injury, we don't have enough evidence to say that yet. We do, however, have some evidence that injury prevalence peaks at zone two of the menstrual cycle. That's about week two. We think it might be because of that spike in hormones, but we don't know. We haven't got the evidence to show that. But we do know that girls are getting injured slightly more at certain times of the menstrual cycle. Not on their period. So lots of players or athletes will say, oh, I got injured because of my period. I was on my period. Essentially, that's because when you're on your period, it's very kind of, no, it's something that's happening to you. So you can put those two things together very quickly. But it's likely to be coincidence. Interestingly, the menstrual cycle hormones affect how we feel and behave as women. It affects our metabolism, our hydration, our concentration, our coordination, uh, whether we're in pain or not, whether we feel fatigued or not. All of those things could add to the added to the list of why we might uh, be injured or miss time in training. So understanding the menstrual cycle, for me, is fundamental if we're, if we're working with female athletes. 
doesn't get included in any coaching qualifications, any sort of physiotherapy education, um, we need to be better at that. But what we can change when it comes to injury risk is how we coach women. And we have known this for a long time, this is not new information. Um, about 10 years ago, 2016, okay, so eight years ago, FIFA released um, a programme of conditioning exercises with research behind it that said um, we can reduce ACL injury risk by 45% if we do this programme. But still, you walk around football, grassroots football, right through to um, podium, uh, sorry, performance, you walk around netball, you walk around hockey, and coaches aren't delivering this very basic injury resilience programme. So we're not even doing the stuff that we do know works. Um, because of our skeleton, we move poorly, we land, our knees cave in, when we are changing direction, starting, stopping, our biomechanics is quite poor in terms of protecting the knee joint. With really good coaching and really deliberate intentional coaching, we can change that element. <clears throat> we can create muscle balance, we can create, create stability as coaches. Um, but we have to, as coaches and as strength and conditioning coaches, we have to know how to and be really good at it. And we have a whole host of people walking around sport who aren't. <clears throat> this is the research behind the FIFA 11 Plus programme. There are now programmes in, uh, in netball called Jump High Land Strong, in World Rugby called Activate. We know how to condition athletes, female athletes, so they are at less risk of injury. But we still don't do it well enough. Um, but we know that we can actually negate some of the sex differences if we do this. Three times a week for 10 minutes is part of a warm-up. It's not complex or kind of over-engineered. There are other things on the list in terms of women and risk factors uh, for injury. Women get put on poorer playing surfaces. So we either get a ship pitch, or we get the pitch after the boys have played on it and churned it up, or we get put on artificial surfaces. All of those things put us at greater risk of injury. Then, you know, we'll go into Super League, women's Super League, and they'll say, no, but look now all of the girls are playing on the, the men's pitch is pristine. But you're moving them back and forth. Because they, their priority in terms of logistics and scheduling of pitches is, is pretty low. And moving back and forth from 3G, artificial, to grass is a risk factor for injury. Having boots that aren't made for your feet is a risk factor for injury. If you imagine football boots are designed, moulded on men's feet, the rigidity of the sole and the length and the sort of grippiness of the studs is designed to hold a man in place. Men have greater power, greater speed, greater strength, greater muscle mass, different distribution of muscle mass, and we design this perfect boot so that when they turn, it just holds them well enough so they don't slip, but allows them to sprint and accelerate. When you put a woman in those boots, anchors her to the ground, and as she's trying to turn, you can imagine the stress that's going through her knee, and it can contribute to the fact that that knee then is injured. There's loads of other environmental factors that can contribute. Even things like stress and not feeling like you belong can create anxiety, can create burnout, can create under-recovery, can create uh, wanting to control and over-exercise, and all of those things contribute to injuries. So we have to look at the whole environment, not just the physical person. Baz mentioned uh, Bobby Clay, who didn't start her periods because she was uh, an aspiring athlete who was really controlling what she ate to stay light and lean. And when in a female body you do that, when you don't eat enough to meet the demands of your training, your brain says, what can I shut off to save energy right now? Because I can't survive on this amount of energy and doing this amount of exercise. Uh, so we can't shut our brain off, it's really energy consuming, but we would die. And we can't shut our neuromuscular system off, consumes energy, but we would die. We could shut our immune function off, but give ourselves three or four days, we'd die. But in a female body, oh, we can shut off this whole system, the reproductive system. We don't have to produce those hormones, we don't have to have those periods, we certainly don't have to grow a baby, we'll save tons of energy. And that's what happens, but those hormones are so vital for all parts of our functioning physical and psychological, that when athletes underfuel and they are not supported to recognise it and to rectify it, all of these body systems become affected. So bone health is compromised and in extreme cases osteoporosis developed. Gastrointestinal issues start to occur. There's a 70% increased risk of depression in athletes who are underfueling. Um, that 
migration to trading all but ceases. We need to really raise awareness in coaches and athletes about what's normal and what's not, and not having a menstrual cycle and not having periods is not, and it puts us at greater risk of injury and illness as athletes. And certainly our long-term health, having osteoporosis when we are 40 instead of 70 or 80, having infertility, is not a problem for the athletes now, but it will be a problem for them uh, in the years after they've left us in sport. I just wanted to finish uh, and spend a couple of minutes talking to you about concussion. Because being female is also a risk factor for concussion. So females are twice as likely to suffer a concussion than men. And even though the absolute like, bottom line in terms of guidance for concussion is if in doubt, sit them out. Women are removed from the field of play less often than males when there is a suspected concussion. We're not being vigilant enough in these girls. Um, why are women more at risk? We have weaker necks and lighter heads. Concussion is all about how our brain is bobbling around in our head and when it's smacking up against our skull or when it's twisting. And if we don't have strong necks and if we have light heads that can whiz around, that brain rotation and that brain movement is greater. Um, our brain itself is, again, our, our brain cells are longer and thinner and so more likely to be disturbed when our brain does move inside our skull. We don't learn to move very well, we don't learn to fall over. There's a gender play gap from the age of five where boys and girls develop different movement skills that we need to address, otherwise we've got girls more at risk of injury. And we do think that the hormones of the menstrual cycle might be important in terms of the severity of the outcomes, but I can guarantee no one at the moment is collecting time of cycle, time of the menstrual cycle, when they are trying to diagnose and treat concussion. Uh, women have longer and more severe outcomes than male peers when they've suffered a concussion. Women have more mental health issues following a concussion. And when we talk about injury, having a concussion also increases our risk of lower limb injury following that concussion. So, we all know that concussion is important for many reasons, but in females, we need to be extra diligent. And we need to be extra diligent about what we're going to do about subconcussion and brain health. So for those of you who um, haven't heard of subconcussion, concussion is where you get all the, you know, the, the symptoms, so blurry vision, you, know, you might black out, uh, slow speech, don't know who you are, don't know who I am, etc. There is a checklist where we can say, this brain has been shaken up and it's causing us very, very uh, obvious symptoms. Subconcussion is when the brain undergoes a quarter of the force of a full concussion. All of these pictures here show someone receiving subconcussion. Whether someone's driving their knee into you, trying to get a ball and it goes into your shoulder and you fly off, whether it's a hockey stick to the head, a lacrosse stick to the head, uh, falling on a hard ground on a neck and pitch, um, bashing into a goal post, falling over, whatever. Any time we go through quite a lot of force in our body, our brain undergoes force as well. And what that does is it might just feel like, oh gosh, yeah, I'll get up and I'll, I'll carry on. We've damaged the brain in that moment. Now with concussion, we have at least 21 to 28 days after a concussion to let the brain recover. That is vital. After a subconcussion, we run off and run straight into another person. We don't let the brain recover. And so every time the brain gets slightly damaged, it gets inflamed. It doesn't get to recover, so the inflammation stays. And over time, over a season of suffering, let's say 500 subconcussions, your brain starts to produce proteins in response to this damage and this inflammation, that are the proteins we see in the brains of people with Alzheimer's, dementia, and neurodegeneration. Unequivocally, now, the experts know that subconcussion has played a huge role in the reasons why we have rugby players who have early onset dementia at 40. This is not just about being knocked out. <clears throat> this is about protecting our brains any time we run out in sport. Um, and we have so much data to show that this is an issue. Some people say we will look back in 10 years and be like, what the heck are we doing? Sending kids out onto rugby pitches without brain protection. Oh, we mandate young shields because teeth are very important. I would rather have a toothless 40 year old son than I would a son who is on a pathway of neurodegeneration. Um, we have loads of evidence now, we need to start doing something because this will come back to bite us 
um, or you know, just to show, flash you the, the solution. Because we, we don't get any uh, permission from this, we need innovation. Because scrum caps are not brain protection. Scrum caps protect our heads from knocks, scrapes, bumps, bruises. Our brain is still rattling around inside our head when we get to have a scrum cap on. So we need innovation in this area, full stop. People need to start thinking about how we protect the brains of everyone in sport, particularly the, the generation of, of youngsters that are coming up. One company has made the only kite marked, PPE kite marked protection for brain caps. It's called the Razon Halo. It's a headband, it's got technology inside that absorbs 60% of the rotational forces through our brain. Um, we need to get this on the heads of everybody in sport, particularly the heads of kids in sport. There is nothing to say why we shouldn't. All the evidence points to we need to be better at protecting the brains of people in sport. Um, and now we have some solutions. Hopefully in the future we'll have more solutions. But it amazes me that we still have NGPs who won't go near this stuff. They say, we've got instruments and mouth guards over, that's fine. I say, brilliant. So you know how much force is going through people's heads. Great. It still went through their head. Now at the elite level, they can use those instrumentation to say, okay, well, we'll ma uh, manipulate what that player is being exposed to in the following week. We don't have that at the low elite level. So we have players who are going out with unprotected brains and accruing damage that in 10 years' time will really be life limiting uh, and life impacting. So hopefully, that was a bit depressing, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> hopefully, I've given you an insight into why, you know, why injury is so important for everyone, but why injury um, is particularly pertinent when we're dealing with supporting women. And if we're going to create a system in sport which says, women, you belong here and we want to help you thrive, we want to optimise your performance, we need to do better in these areas as well as all of the other areas that Baz mentioned at the beginning. Um, I'm going to plug our book uh, because um, we've put all this down in a book. Uh, uh, from when I worked in Olympic and Paralympic sport, I saw that coaches didn't know this, athletes didn't know this, uh, how to understand your female body so that it doesn't hold you back from whatever potential you want to realise. So this is going to be uh, on sale in the break and in lunch uh, but it really is, it's about women, but it's not exclusively for women, it's for everyone who wants to support women in sport. So we're really proud that's being launched, uh, published next Thursday, but uh, we've got some early copies for you if you want to buy them today. Uh, I think we're going to invite the panel up now, thank you. I've got my phone up here with me, so I'll be looking at some of the comments as well. So thank you very much indeed for getting involved. A thank you to Emma and Baz, and also delighted to welcome elite athlete Mary McLennan. Give her Mary a big round of applause. Thank you. So I'll start by asking a few questions, and then I'll look to the audience. If you've got a question, raise your hand, tell us who you are, which organisation you're representing, and then we'll get to your question. We have some microphones in the audience, so let's get the panel discussion underway. I'll ask the first question from here then, Baz, if I may. By the way, I've got my copy of the book, as a dad of two girls, I can't wait. So thank you very much, Steve, for that copy, available in all good bookshops, and you can pre-sell on Amazon. Did we say 50% commission or 20? Oh, okay, 20. <laughs> 20 is good. Uh, first of all then, as I take my seat, Baz, what a provocative question. Why that question? Um, why that question? Because I think that we can get lost in the success that we're seeing uh, in women's sport. We can just celebrate, oh my gosh, like, look how amazing the Lionesses are doing, we've done it. And we can see, you know, that the BBC are doing this, Sky's doing this, you know, we've got sponsorship deals from TikTok. It's like, hang on, let's just take a moment here and let's really challenge what's going on. Okay, it's a very good question, thank you. Uh, Marion, hello, good morning to you, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. So, Emma and Baz's presentation. Can you relate to what you've heard this morning? Uh, yeah, 100%. Um, I think it is an interesting question, do women belong in sport? And I think the answer is yeah, we do belong, but is sport tailored to us? Or tailored with women in mind? Absolutely not. Um, I've experienced all of the problems of our concussion and I'm not participating in a, a contact sports. But yeah, I've not been supported, not received information resources, I'm educated now about the topics because I've had to learn the hard way, I've had, uh, yeah, I've intentionally limited food intake, suffered red eggs, uh, broken my bones, um, 
Yeah, absolutely nothing. <laughs> and when you say not had support, you mean from the governing bodies, from coaches, from the All sports, of the above. Everybody. Yeah, so um, I also run my own organisation and yesterday we published a report based off the survey that we conducted in December. Um, and it's the female athlete health report and the findings are that 4% of athletes received educational support from the national governing body um, about female athlete health, about red eyes, about body image, about how to train with their cycle time. Um, yeah, 4% is pretty shocking, it's, it's beyond not good enough. Um, and how do you react to that when you hear that? Just surprisingly, because we have we have a whole host of uneducated athletes, coaches, practitioners. By the way, all well intentioned, um, for the most part, they're absolutely open to learning, but it just hasn't been integrated in any any training and qualification pathways. And and at the moment, we're at the moment we're working with Simspa. We've created a uh, professional standards which says if you are going to create qualifications around supporting coaches and athletes to learn more about this stuff, these are the things that should include. And that was the first step to set to quality assuring content to deliver education. It didn't exist before, so it's not like we just didn't have the content, we didn't have any framework by which to deliver that. So we are making steps in the right direction. But I mean I think in an area like this, it still feels like a nice to have, not a non-negotiable, and it absolutely is a non-negotiable. Like the foundations of an athlete's health are fundamental, and we're not doing well enough in women's health. So instead of saying, "Oh, we don't have budget this year," you know, it's it's um, Mari works in safeguarding as well, and it's like these things are the building blocks of of NGBs and sports and organisations. They shouldn't be the things that, if we have some money left in the pot in March, we'll yeah. we'll do something. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about safeguarding, we've got a big panel uh, this afternoon on safeguarding. And, and Laurie, for you, when, when you look back at your career, do you believe more should have been done in, in schools at a grassroots level as you built up to the Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my career is still ongoing, really. Um, <laughs> uh, granted that the broken foot isn't going to be even any further competitions. Um, but yeah, I think there, there's just no education. I remember having a conversation with my coach, I must have been around 15, 16, and he said something along the lines of, <laughs> yeah, so uh, there'll be like a week in the <laughs> month of my life. <laughs> and like, uh, you know, 15 years, yeah, yeah, long less. And as a 15 year old, we're like, I think he's talking about it, just like, oh, I guess that's what he means. And you know, yeah, you get to, to be an adult, and that information doesn't really change. You know, where, where is it that you are supposed to go for this information? If you have a coach that is informed, um, our, again, our report showed that athletes who have well-informed coaches suffer 36% less red eye symptoms. So having an informed coach is hugely beneficial to you actually being able to perform with your bodies with the best intentions or perform you know, to your body's best capacity. But yeah, there's it's, it's kind of a potluck, like I'm saying, there's no, there's no consistent approach, there's no um, cross-sport consistency or even cross-national governing body consistency. Safe, both safeguarding and female athlete health are not integrated into all levels of coaching qualifications in any way, shape or form. It's like, well, if you're level one, it's skill-based, so you're going to learn how to do X, Y, Z, and it's not until like level two or level three that they start thinking, oh, well, now you should probably know about female athlete health, because you know, you're, you're stepping up in the coaching line. You know that from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Also, I'm acutely aware we're in London, and I come from a little country called Wales. Matt and I were talking about this earlier on, about does it, is there a discrepancy, not only within sports, but within national government bodies, but also within the four corners of the United Kingdom. Oh. Yeah, there are. And I think that you know, sometimes the, the smaller nations are quicker because they get access to the, you know, the, the people in charge of the United Kingdom. Small but successful. Small but yeah. yeah. successful, okay. yeah. <laughs> and I think that you know, definitely in Scotland, like, you know, there are issues everywhere, but Scotland have, been, have, have made so much progress. Like, they were the first people to produce um, the concussion guidance. They've got free sanitary products in all public spaces. That's something that is just not happening in England. So I think that sometimes, this, and I've done some great work in Ireland where uh, with, um, uh, I did mean, a course on, we train all the people from um, Irish triathlon, swimming, Irish swimming, Irish athletic, Irish cycling, on training menopause and women. So that, that just happened all quite easily and quickly. So I think that if, if you have people in those nations that really want to do it, they can get it going quicker than they can necessarily. What combinations of regions come together? Oh, collaboration. 
question. Yeah. yeah. So we can think. Yeah, hey, yeah. hey, all the questions. Why don't we work together? Yeah. yeah. That's another question for another year, maybe. Can I just ask you, Emma, about because I'm looking forward to reading the book, right? So Dad and Dad are two year olds who want uh, to kind of left school because she's been performing arts and uh, bringing a whole new world of difficulties with her knees because she's a, a, a theatre school dancer. The youngest, football obsessed, right? La and I'm watching your presentation thinking, I have to ask you this question in front of our invited audience. She wanted to practice headers, right? So she's not doing headers at the moment in her football. So she's asked me to work with our doing headers. And she's asked me, is that part of it? Is that part of it? Now, should I be, and should the coach be teaching Poppy and her mates in the school football team headers? So I think headers has been an easy way for football to suggest that they're being proactive around brain health. Actually, 30% 30, 30 of injury to the brain is, is, is caused by headers. There's a whole lot of other things going on on a football pitch that's causing forces to move through the brain that damage it. So I would say that it's almost like a smoke screen if we just focus on headers. I think we need to understand things like uh, the developing brain and when we might introduce things like heading, uh, but I think just cutting it out of the game and saying, okay, tip, we've done concussion, now I'm some concussion, is, is completely wrong. Um, I think learning to do it right, I think putting that on her, that's FIFA approved, so you can head with that, and it actually absorbs some of the force going through your brain. Um, I think being proactive in trying to understand, you know, what age groups we're comfortable with heading in, uh, and what are we doing to protect the brain, but I think just focusing on heading is the wrong move because then it's just, sport inherently is going to damage the brain. I think we all want to accept that and that's one of the biggest challenges people have because lots of people involved in, in managing and running sport have played sport their whole life and so it's holding them around and saying, look at that, that was, you know, like, that might have done some damage. Yes, it might have done, but now we are in a position to do something about it. So we, we, we can't be afraid of saying, some sports damage our brains, unless we do something proactive about it. Um, and you know, we didn't wear seat belts, we didn't wear ski uh, skiing helmets, we didn't wear cycling helmets for a long time until we go, oh yeah, cycling can damage our brain if we fall off, so let's put a hat on. And that's now become completely part of the course. So um, I think distilling it down to very specific things like heading is helpful in some ways, but we are not at the exclusion of considering how we're going to protect brains across the whole of sport. We'll come back to injury in, in just a moment. Um, but perhaps you made a really interesting point at the very start of this, where, and what are we? An hour into the conference already, and the image that we get about women's sport is fantastic, lionesses, successful, Olympic medals, Commonwealth medals. So to what extent is the, is the media and the advertising model responsible for maybe not addressing a question like this in the yeah. media? Um, they're starting to address it, but I think that when it's it's not enough, and I think that's what we've got to that's what we've all got to accept that like just putting putting girls and women on the telly or on websites is it, not enough, and we actually have to be working as hard to kind of like integrating this female health content into every single like PE teachers have no education about girls going through puberty. And if you think about that, like as a PE teacher, you could have one, you could be a male PE teacher in an all boys school, have one lesson in year eight and hang up to get a girl pregnant. And then, and then you go to university, PE college, and suddenly you're head of sport in a girls school, and you don't, you've got no clue, and you've got no lived experience. And so we, we are attempting, with our work with Sibsa, but also like, what we want to do is make sure that this, this book is to kind of like, it, it's for the masses, but what we're also attempting to do is integrate this education into all existing PT, personal training qualifications, coach qualifications, and teaching qualifications. So that because nothing will change unless you totally redesign the education of people supporting girls and women. And I think to the point about, you know, the media, the media have a really important role to play in terms of having open discussions about these topics. So you will still hear you know, if athletes bring up, uh, I think there uh, was a Dina who said, yeah. just met girls, I've got girl stuff, cut back to the studio, and everyone kind of accepted, oh, you know, isn't it great that she's talking about girl stuff? No one said the word period. 
And to hear everyone here, the people saying periods, menstrual cycles, pelvic floors, sports bras, eating disorders, like everyone is embarrassed about it. We have to just like break some of the, the, the shame and stigma around these words. And that is where we can do that because in the media, people can, can do that on the platform, but they're not comfortable yet. And I think it's all very well to say we want to get education in, but at the very basic level, people have to be more confident and comfortable talking about these topics. And sport is, you know, at the last Olympics, 10% of the head coaches were women. So 90% of the coaches were men. And Mari's experience of, of you know, a coach who kind of wants to embrace some of the female stuff, but doesn't know how, doesn't feel comfortable, We've got to also address that, and that's through, you know, saying it's okay to talk about this stuff, this is normal. Uh, and for girls, that will be hugely empowering, but it also will change everyone else's perception of these topics. So, Mara, what's your view on that in terms of coaching structure, if you like, and also the way the media reports the, the, the sport and also issues around it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with what has already been said. I think, with, in terms of your question around the media, we, like, I, as somebody who, I love my sport and I spend a lot of time talking quite negatively generally about sport, it's a bit of a juxtaposition in terms of that, that tension that exists between wanting to promote women's role in sport and wanting to promote women's sport in general and elevate it because it has been in the shadow and we have been treated as small men. But there, there's a very real issue that when women don't, I guess, currently belong in sports, and that we can't just say, we can't just celebrate the line as a success and then kind of assume that therefore that's it fixed. So there, there is, I think both roles do need to take place, and as far as said, we need to be putting equal amounts of effort into kind of restructuring sport and how it considers women athletes, and then also saying look, women's sport is really worthwhile investing in, it's really worthwhile watching, you know, they're, they're, they're equally amazing performers. So they're, they're both things need to happen, and yet media plays a hugely important role in that. We can't be having headlines where it says that, you know, having blue shorts is a game changer or is revolutionary. It's not. It's really basic. Um, absurd that that would be like the biggest achievement of women's sport in a year. Uh, like that's sad that that headline was even allowed to be passed. Um, and then I guess yeah, in terms of coach education, like absolutely, that there needs to be, as I was saying earlier, robust, consistent, comprehensive education on female athlete health at all levels of coaching qualifications in every single sport. And I think setting standards with Simsbo is a really good step towards actually ensuring that that's happening because as has been highlighted, with many issues in sport, there is no cross-sport consistency, there's no cross-nation consistency. And for as long as the UK exists as a construct, we have to have cross-nation consistency and cross-sport consistency because as, a, as an athlete, I'm Scottish, I have a Scottish club, but I also have an English club. I don't exist as an athlete only in one nation. So having rules and regulations that are specific to Scotland is pretty pointless. Because as athletes that inhabit the, the space in the UK, you exist and as an athlete you compete and participate and engage with athletes in all four nations. So by not having a joined up uh, kind of process or a joined up approach to what we're doing in terms of safeguarding, in terms of female athlete health, you're, you're just creating and exacerbating problems in how athletes are being treated. And to not be informed of female athlete health is a failure of duty of care. And you are inadvertently creating abusive and toxic coaching environments where athletes have an of body image, are overtraining, are breaking their bones. So it's not just, you know, and, and, and it, is, it is not like a witch hunt, and it is not pinning these people up as bad and failing. It's that the system has failed them to be able to support athletes appropriately and adequately. So the yeah. yeah. Um, Emma, concussion formed a lot of your presentation. Four years ago, I sat in this panel and we discussed gambling in sport. That was one of the big discussions. And I told the story when I first started watching sport on telly, I remember all the tobacco advertising. Mm. And, and the booze, especially watching the studio, which I then presented for six years, I watched the booze sport. And then Bill Wurmley would be sitting there with another 10 pints, and then knocking in at 100 break, and then going back with another 10 pints, and then everyone would go, oh, there you see, where, where. And, and so 
So many English fans thought, in a couple of years' time, we may get to a point where we'll go, well, can you believe football teams are gambling across their shirts, man? Nothing's changed in four years, right? Do you honestly believe that in four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years' time, the world go, well, can you believe we're allowed with our sports stars and also our grassroots stars, young women to play rugby and smash heads in the struggles the rocks? Do you think we're, we're reaching that point? Oh, it's a bit sad that you say nothing's changed with the gambling stuff. Actually. Yeah, that was four years. I'm yeah. Four years. Um, because I, would, I just don't think we, have, we can ignore the evidence. Um, you know, I was going to say, when you were saying that story, I was going to say, well, you know, concussion is about people's lives. So is gambling, right? Uh, chemicals, mental health issues, suicides, you know, all the same, this is the same round. Um, I really hope, and I think we can, we probably can do a better job at grassroots and at entry level and in schools uh, because we can A, create really good habits. So if you ask the 40 year old rugby player to put on that headband and say, I've done all right so far and I'm a bit stupid. Uh, when I asked my 11 year old son to put on that headband, I said, can you wear this for rugby? And he said, why? I said, it's the latest innovation of protecting your brain health. He went, sure, all right, put it on, ran around. His friend said, what's that? I said, oh, it's the latest innovation of protecting brain health. <laughs> and he said, and the mum said, is it? And then, you know, now his whole team wear it. They have no problem. And now that's yeah. their behaviour they'll associate. So I think at that level, we can start to make a change. It's a bit like, I guess, with smoking. There's a generation of people, let's forget that they're all vaping, um, that, that are, are not smoking because it's much harder to act with cigarettes and there's a different narrative around it. And maybe we have, we have to invest in, in that kind of moving that generation through so that when they are the coaches and the leaders of sport, it is completely normal for them to see us looking after, for example, brains in this very proactive way. Um, but I think, very deeply entrenched cultures uh, around sports in the generations of older athletes and older coaches is, is harder to change. Mari, do you like, see a nod in the head? Do you think there's a generational change? There's much more of, a, of an understanding and awareness? Well, I don't know if there's an understanding and an awareness yet, but I think it's our duty uh, to ensure that there is. <coughs> so it is absolutely a certainty that okay, we can talk about legislative change and we can talk about policy change and we can talk about structural change and those are all really important in order to, I, I suppose, provide the, the backbone to cultural change because it's difficult to then change culture and people look up to structures and they don't hold that culture up then people are just going to fall back to what the structure is suggesting should be the case. But, um, yeah, having that educational piece of like going into local clubs, going into schools, and, and changing the mindsets of the young people who are the you know, future leaders of tomorrow, then that's where we can make real change. And I, I think, yeah, we do we do need both, but absolutely, it's it's imperative that we, we make that effort to do so. And I guess, as Emma was saying, a lot of these kind of ingrained cultures of you know success at all any costs and performance being the kind of podium priority. Um, that's why a lot of these things haven't been addressed because we don't see female athlete health and safeguarding as directly correlated to performance and, and you know prioritizing that overall athlete welfare. And so for as long as national governing bodies funding is contingent on medal count and doesn't have other criteria alongside it as 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 you know as, as important or as you know emphasized alongside it being as important then we, we are going to struggle to see change we are going to struggle to see national governing for bodies prioritizing female you know, health education as much as you know hiring a new strength conditioning coach yeah. okay absolutely thank you very much Lee. Uh, fabulous panel an opportunity now for you to ask a few questions we've got a few roving mics in the audience i can see a few hands so we've got about five minutes of questions i can see two here so if our audio team could take the microphone up to uh, somebody in the middle hello the lights are a bit strong here yeah. hello if you can just tell us who you are and who you represent and who you question for that would be yeah, awesome. certainly um, i'm james hogan i'm the ceo of skateboard gb um, and I guess this question is to anyone on the panel. Um, we're a new governing body. Um, we're starting to, um, you know, really look at our learning offer, um, our talent pathway, our world class performance program. Um, 
the whole debate around concussion and female athlete health is something that I really want to um, look at as we start that journey. Um, we've got a whole cohort of 14, 15, 16 year old girls that are competing at a world class level um, and I absolutely want them to be protected and to be okay on their 20, 30, 40, 50. How do we start a conversation and with whom to get that support? Good question. <laughs> Great. We'll, we'll chat with you. <laughs> um, you can start by buying the book. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I mean, that's exactly what. Uh, so, a couple of weeks ago, we launched a big program with England Netball. Um, you would think, as a 99% as a uh, majority of female sport, they probably nailed this. We went and presented to them two years ago, and they were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> We haven't got this stuff in our, in our pathways and our performance. So we launched a big project with them across the next, you know, it's been going for a year, across the next two years. Um, and really trying to make systematic and strategic changes within the NGB. Um, we have our day work with the FA and the Pro Game, uh, working with the NGB. We also then have smaller NGBs with the same absolutely brilliant ambitions as you. A uh, small, agile, starting essentially from scratch. How brilliant not to have to deconstruct, but do, to construct from the ground up. Um, and what we, I think we would probably ask is that the system, UK Sport, Sport England, help create efficiencies in this space. Because if we've got a GB climbing, a badminton, you know, uh, around as England, uh, all wanting to do really well in this space as agile small NGVs, don't make you all reinvent, you know, like the same thing. So I think there is a system-wide need to help efficiencies be created. I don't know if you agree with us. Yeah? No, no, yeah. No. But yeah, do, do come and chat with us as well. I'd love to speak with you. Okay, thank you. Great question. I think there's another one in the middle. Yes. Hello. Hello, Jenny Tom, uh, Governance and Sustainability Consultant for Agile Sport and also a current athlete with uh, an ACL rupture. Um, so this is a really prevalent topic for me and I guess one of the things I'm interested in is whether you think all MGBs and sporting bodies should have compulsory female coaching programmes and what the time frame for that would look like. Okay, great question. Uh, I mean, yes, they should have mandatory training for all coaches at all levels, absolutely. Um, I, I will pass to Val and then I'll the time scale, but I guess intuition would say as soon as possible, but ensuring that it's robust, comprehensive. Yeah. When you rush these things, it, it could mean that it's not of the quality that you want. Yeah, and I think that this this since the standard, this girls and women standard is really helpful. So I think that now every time a coach poll comes up for renewal and it wants to adhere to that standard, this is there. And, and most coach qualifications have to be renewed every two or three years. Um, so I I would say um, nothing has been mandated from no from from anybody that can <laughs> mandate these things. But if we if we five years is ambitious and ten years is doable is my kind of like is what I what I, where we think we're at. We often because you know we said that we want to get this integrated into all the different governing bodies. But in the meantime, we produce these four CPD courses aligned to the life stages, which are really um, generic. So they um, we do a female body one, a puberty one, a pre and postnatal one, and a menopause one. So anyone can purchase that, and they're very much aimed at people without a sports science degree or physiology degree. They're kind of really, really practical. So that's kind of our stopgap approach. But we absolutely have to be. Uh, demanding more of those people and not just allowing them to say, oh, we don't have the funding, we don't have the budget, or we'll get down to this. It's just like, and, it, and it's creating that groundswell of opinion. And, you know, we've been doing this now for, this is our third year, uh, the, the well launch just over two years ago. When we launched, we honestly were having meetings with governing bodies who were just sat there with their arms folded and were like, oh, we're all right, thanks. We're all right, eh? We're really, we're a really successful sport. I'm a really successful coach. We are like, you know, world beaters. You can't give us any examples of teams that are doing this that are beating us. Our women are not talking about any of this stuff. Like, we're all right. But if you think, we are not having to convince people anymore that this is, a, this is important. The conversations are very, very different. And 
two years, I would say that's, that's quick, like with, with how, how the conversation has shifted. So um, we need to be hopeful, we need to like, see it as a massive opportunity, but it needs, it, it needs collaboration and it needs constant, it, it needs energy. And I think that when people are in their roles and they're exhausted or they feel they're fighting on their own, they're kind of a lone wolf in kind of a school or a government body or a team or a club, like sometimes it just feels like a bit too much, you know, to kind of like keep fighting the fight. Yeah. But we have got, we work with one MGP who I, I believe by September will be mandated to training for all coaches like you know, women in their sport. And they have done that quite quickly. Um, now it will take a while for all those coaches to receive the training. But um, again, it's, it's a bit like the, you know, Wales, Scotland being quite agile. But I think MGBs have, if, it, if we have the quality content, which we hope, you know, um, we are providing, and, and as the standards become readily available, other, other training providers can provide quality training. Um, I think we need to push um, um, entities to be a bit agile on this front because um, you know there's a huge need. Fantastic, great discussion. Thank you, thank you for your questions. My thanks to Emma, Baz, and Mari. Please give them a huge round of applause.